I'm particularly excited about this because I know this young lady sitting over here. She really knows how to sing, and even more, she knows how to communicate a message, a message of freedom and liberty and how we can use blockchain, how we can use Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to get the word out more. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming a wonderful lady for freedom and liberty, Tatiana Morose. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Terry, for that nice introduction. And thank you uh, to Nexus for having me out. I'm happy to be here with you all, despite the uh, altitude sickness that I think that we're all sort of mildly feeling at this point. <laughs> um, but um, so I'm talking to you guys today about cryptocurrency and art and music. And I think the best way to sort of unpack that subject is to give you my backstory and to give you a sense of what motivates me and why I ended up at this cross section of fintech and art, which I never thought because if seven years ago you told me I would be working in finance and technology, <laughs> I'd laugh in your face. Um, because I've always considered myself a singer songwriter. Uh, ever since I was a little girl, I you know, always wanted to sort of use music to save the world. And I think it started when my mom would pay, play for me those 60s and 70s singer-songwriters, and I would listen to different kinds of things driving with her. And I remember listening to Cat Stevens' Peace Train and thinking, wow, you could use music to convey an idea and to actually evoke some sort of emotion out of somebody. And I thought that that was really, really powerful. Um, I also thought a lot about how the world was organized, and I remember going to my mother, who um, was from Poland. I said, Mom, you know, why don't we all just put our money into a little pile, and then people can take money out, and that's perfect, right? And she's like, no, Tanya, that's communism, and it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> she's from Poland, so she knows. Um, so I went on to high school, and I grew up in New Jersey, and I was reading, you know, the typical dystopian novels that they assigned to you. So 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, I was sufficiently frightened by these uh, ominous <laughs> warnings from the past. Uh, and then around 97, I went off to Berklee College of Music in Boston. And around that time is where I call it like the death of music. Uh, meaning the advent of Britney Spears and all of her kind of artists. Now, look, I will listen to some Britney Spears in the gym, I'm not going to lie, but if you're somebody who really cares about, you know, changing the universe or whatever and having music have a positive impact, that whole uh, girl, boy band nonsense, like porno pop, really upset me. So I went off to Berkeley and... I watched a bunch of documentaries, kept reading. After I went back from school, I moved to New York, um, which is you know right outside of New Jersey, I guess. I still lived in New Jersey. Anyway, I started managing all these really great recording studios in Manhattan, and I was pursuing my, uh, my singer-songwriter career. But even though I went to Berkeley and I had a certain amount of aptitude and talent, um, I didn't really think that it was a very, uh, it was just miserable, basically. Playing gigs in New York is really, really difficult. Getting people to come out is really difficult. It's especially difficult if you have no money. So I understood the, the, the difficulty for artists in terms of um, financing really early on. I got very excited about social media. You know, I started out with Friendster, and then I moved to MySpace, and then I moved to Facebook. But as I moved from platform to platform, I realized that that platform is the one that owns the relationship. Um, so now, whenever I want to reach my fans on Facebook, I have to pay in order to reach them. Along the way, I was watching a lot of different documentaries, and I got really interested in Dennis Kucinich. So in the 2008 elections, I thought, this is my 60s, 70s revolution era. You know, I'm going to fight the man. And unfortunately, Dennis Kucinich didn't win, and I had learned about Ron Paul at the same time. And I liked Ron Paul, but I didn't understand why he didn't want universal health care. I didn't understand why he hated the EPA. I was like, what's wrong with this guy? Um, but in 2011, I saw the movie The Money Masters, and I also watched America, Freedom to Fascism, and Fiat Empire, and that's really where I, I feel like I identified the enemy. And to me, the enemy was the Federal Reserve. And of course, as a uh, opponent of the Federal Reserve, I joined the Ron Paul movement, which was really, really neat because there are people from the left and from the right. I mean, I had never identified, I guess people in New Jersey are supposed to be Democrats. Like, I didn't pick one, you know, I didn't really see why I had to choose a team or anything. Uh, and what was really neat about the Ron Paul movement was that it was bringing everybody together. And really, 
it was also really neat to see how everybody was kind of adding their own little flavor of whatever it is that they were good for, for this higher purpose. So this person makes t-shirts, that person is good at marketing, and everybody was sort of pooling their efforts. And I, I really fell in love with the community and the philosophy of libertarianism and subsequently anarchism. Um, but when I saw what happened in the 2008 elections, I became very uh, disillusioned with the political process. I'm sorry, 2012 elections. So uh, for those of you that weren't really following along, Ron Paul arguably should have gotten the ticket or they should have like let him uh, into the, the big, uh, what do you call that, the Republican National Convention at the end as like a potential uh, person. But the Republican Party broke their own rules. And as we saw with this past election, Democratic Party broke their own rules. They literally rigged the election. Nobody says anything. Nobody's going to jail. Uh, Washerman's got a job. I, I, I don't understand how that even happens. Um, so I became really depressed. And I was like, oh, what are we going to do? Liberty's going to die. And <laughs> the guys <laughs> from BitPay were kind enough to sponsor me uh, at the Ron Paul event down in, um, at, uh, in Tampa. And then they came up to New York and they told me all about Bitcoin. This is Tony Gallippi and Stephen Pear. These are like luminaries in the uh, in the Bitcoin space. And they spent at least two hours trying to explain it to me. And I hate the Federal Reserve. I love liberty. I didn't want anything to do with Bitcoin. I wanted them to leave me alone. <laughs> and and so I gave them my, my, my $500, which was like a lot for me back then. And I bought some Bitcoins at $11. So as I went up, Imagine that. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to sell them along the way. Don't applaud. <laughs> um, <laughs> come on, let's be realistic. <laughs> so uh, along the way, as the, as the Bitcoins went up in value, I became, imagine that, more interested. <laughs> and I remember taking a ride from Livertopia uh, down in San Diego all the way up to Malibu with Jeffrey Tucker. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen Jeffrey Tucker speak, but one of the best qualities about Jeffrey is that he has this storytelling kind of way about him. And what was really cool about the way that he explained to me Bitcoin was the way that it could impact society. He didn't try and torture me with technical stuff. He just tried to make me imagine what a world would look like with these opportunities. And so I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. And I thought, well, we need a jingle or something because nobody's going to get this stuff. Uh, and as somebody who really wanted to bring people in, I decided to write a Bitcoin jingle. So I'm going to break up my talk with, uh, with that song for you guys. Do we have a, is this one on? Are we getting uh, the, is this bottom? Oh, it's on. Okay, cool. Great. I didn't want to give any of my money to a nation based on war. I wanted to be free, nothing holding me back from where I want to go. I thought about it, I thought about it. What was the choice that I made? It was to take away the money. Don't give up your money. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. I didn't want to waste any of my time working for the government. I wanted to be kind, open up my mind, just like an instrument. I thought about it, I thought about it. What was the choice that I made? It was to take away the money. Don't give up your money. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. What a little crypto can do. No longer a slave. I don't have to work until the grave. So many times I cried to myself that we didn't have a chance. Nakamoto came along with more than a song, gave the labor back to man. I thought about it, I thought about it. What was the choice that I made? It was to take away the money. Don't give up your money. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. 
Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. Use Bitcoin whenever you pay. Thank you. So I sang that song to the uh, to Argentinians down at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference. And Latin America is such an incredible place. Um, I love going down. Uh, the Latin American Bitcoin Conference is one of my favorite ones of the year because the vibe is really good. And that's really a place where they need cryptocurrency, right? Places like Argentina and Latin America and stuff. Um, they need it here, too, for that matter. Uh, and, you know, I wrote that song. It sounds sort of like a jingle, but I really meant what I was saying. And the thing that I really loved about crypto, too, is that I could basically not fight with people about politics but still subvert them into my political philosophy. <laughs> um and, and that was a real problem because as an artist, you know, first of all, you're sort of isolated if you're not, like, really hard left. And, and as an artist, you really want to bring people together, at least I do. So it was really hard trying to tell people about the things that I believed in without feeling that people were going to kind of judge me. And that sort of extends a little bit larger to the, to the music industry itself. Um, we've been at war for, what, like 17 years now, right? Oh, how nice. Maybe we can go for the cool 20. Uh, why don't we have any anti-war songs on the radio? I think that that's really, really strange. Uh, I think that artists are not pro-war all of a sudden. I think that the financial structures in the music industry, look, I think record labels are great. Everybody rags on record labels. Me, I've definitely done my fair share. But they provide an important service. They do have some professional level of expertise. And let me tell you something. As a do-it-yourself artist, it's miserable. You have to do everything yourself. And <laughs> then all of a sudden, you have no time for anything else. So, you know, I appreciate the professionals in the music industry. But what I think is the real issue is, is that they have sort of the stranglehold on the finance, right? Uh, there's, they have to, you know, there's limited sources where artists can get funded. And if you want to fund a record... I mean, recording the record is the least of your problems. The marketing budgets for these major records are at least a million dollars or more. So it's not a matter of like, oh, go on, America's Got Talent, you'll be famous. By the way, quick, short, anecdotal story. My family annoyed the hell out of me constantly telling me to go on, uh, you know, America's Got Talent or whatever those shows, are, American Idol, that's it. And, uh, and I went and I, I had an audition because they came to one of my shows, they were doing an audition there. And when they gave me the contract for uh, for coming on the show, they're like, you're great, we love you, you're so awesome, like, thanks. And then they were like, here's this contract. And the contract was a nightmare. I mean, they literally own your career. If you're on screen for a second, not even like they give you a big record deal, they own you by the cajones until you die. And that's so scary to me, that artists, you know, they have their dreams, and they think, oh, I'm gonna go on TV, and they're gonna make me a big star, and all this stuff. And some of them are actually working hard. They're not just like lazy bums that decided they wanted to be a pop star. They're actual artists that have been working on their craft. And they're having this really skewed vi like vision of what artistry is in the first place. Uh, and then they're getting kind of bullied. And then when you get back to the record labels themselves, you know, they have investors. They want to make sure that the money that they're putting in is going to have a return on that investment, right? They can't just randomly just give money away to people, and it's really hard to be successful. So I could see their incentive to not necessarily take a chance and have somebody who's saying something like an anti-war message that's not necessarily going to sell, and they don't necessarily want to take a contentious position. I also question the relationship between uh, Hollywood and the government, but that's a whole other conspiracy theory we don't need to unpack. And I don't even think that we need that conspiracy theory because the, the results are obvious. Does anybody... You know when I cry when I listen, like I cry a lot when I listen to good music. It really, really moves me. When I listen to the radio, I cry because I'm being robbed of good music, and I think that that's a crime against humanity. And that sounds very excessive, but it, I, I don't think so. Um, so I got into the crypto space, and uh, I started working with Adam B. Levine, who is uh, the founder of Let's Talk Bitcoin, really popular podcast. And Adam was doing a, a project at the same time as we did Tatiana Coin, which was like the first artist cryptocurrency. We were all excited. And, uh, and Adam at the same time was doing LTB Coin. So he had a podcasting network. And what he wanted to do was create a loyalty token to uh, compensate his podcasters, sell the token to advertisers, and then also uh, reward his listeners for all the different podcasts and stuff, which was also neat. But we were way ahead of the game. And... As somebody who didn't have any experience in tech uh, or startup culture, I wish somebody told me how long it would take. 
I mean, it was great because we raised $10,000 and I funded my record, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I mean, it was like we built a car, but we didn't have any roads. So making the token is actually really quite easy. We made it on Counterparty. And the problem was is it's like you don't really have a place for the token to, to go around. So let me delve into a little bit more how Tatiana Coin works originally and sort of how it's evolved. And then I can talk a little bit about why I think this is significant um, to some of the problems that I described before. Uh, so Tatiana Coin is a little bit like Kickstarter in that, okay, let's say I do a Kickstarter campaign and you guys want to donate $50. So for $50, you get a t-shirt. But I know the ladies in the audience know that it's really annoying to get another man like box cut t-shirt. Like it's horrible. <laughs> I know, right? It's like the worst. And so, you know, you get these fixed items that are not transferable and you don't really want to, you know, you just sits in your closet and takes up space. It's not something particularly valuable, but you want to show your support for the artist. Here's another random story. I had a fan who was like, I really want you to come to Florida. I'm like, okay. He's like, look, I have all this money. And then he sent me a picture of like, I don't know, like a couple hundred dollars, like a thousand dollars, I don't even know, like a pile of cash. He's like, I want to give this to you. And I'm like, I'm poor and I want to take that, but no thank you. Uh, and, and, you know, there was no like infrastructure because if I had a Kickstarter campaign, I could send them there. But if I'm, if it's not that one month and my fan wants to give me something, I can't really accept it. And plus, even if it didn't feel a little bit creepy, I would still feel strange taking random donations from people. Um, so the Tatiana coin was sort of like an improvement on that. So if you donate $50, you get $50 worth of Tatiana coin. And these are little, you know, digital gift certificates that you can use in my store and you can buy my merchandise. You get a little discount, whatever it is that I want to offer you. And it's like an evolving store. So let's say when you donate, uh, you have all the Tatiana albums and you want to wait until I get a new piece of swag. So you can do that. Or you can sell uh, or send $5 worth to your friend, $5 worth to your mom. You could break it up that way. Uh, so after that, you know, uh, when we, but when we did it, the problem was is that people couldn't buy it with dollars and it was a real nightmare uh, for, for a lot of people. So I think that we probably would have sold more coins if it was easier because even the crypto people couldn't figure it out. And we tried this really weird model where people were bidding on a daily basis. Let me tell you something, when you're trying a new technology, keep it simple because any complication, even for the most like, advanced crypto people, they couldn't figure it out. And there wasn't really a speculative element. Now. If you think about it, a Tatiana coin is a finite item. And just like a baseball card, if they're, if I become more popular, these finite things will go up in value. But we had a really big challenge there because we don't want the SEC to terrorize us. And even if the SEC, uh, you know, let's say they're nice guys, they just want to know what's going on. I don't have money to pay a lawyer to fight the SEC. What are you kidding me? So it's actually kind of interesting because it really stifles innovation, um, which is just you know, another argument for a <laughs> more free, uh, free world. Um, so we also wanted to use the coin, though, as something more than just that digital gift certificate. Going back to that original problem that I said about connecting with your fans on a long-term basis, uh, yeah, Facebook really uh, is very, very upsetting every time they charge me to reach my people because those people are there for me. And when you're using Facebook, you know, they're spying on you. They're doing those weird things where they manipulate your mood. They only show you certain posts. Even though you like somebody's page, that person has to pay for it. And then as an artist, you know, the obvious problems occur as well. And let's say I want to leave Facebook. Man, I'd love to leave Facebook. I feel like I'm like a, like a willing participant there, but I'm not. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, you can't really leave there. And, you know, as I went from platform to platform, I would lose fans. So the nice thing about a cryptocurrency connection is that once somebody has one of your coins, you're constantly connected to them. But what's the obvious problem, right? Is trying to explain to people uh, any kind of like technology, like how to hold a wallet, you know what I mean? This stuff, nobody's gonna know how to do that. Um, so Adam went on and created, we tried to partner with a few different companies to help us solve some of these problems. And nobody was really up for it the way that we wanted to do it. And there we go down the rabbit hole. And next thing I know, Adam has a company, Tokenly, and I'm advising them for the past few years. And luckily, now we've kind of evolved and we've created a platform, which I think is really exciting. Uh, if we have some time at the end, I'm not really a slides person, but I can I can go through that with you guys. But basically, uh, we've created a platform that has so many different utilities. It's been really, really confusing, right? Because the the back, 
I'm not the technologist, so forgive my rudimentary try and, uh, explanation of this, but the back end um, can be used for all different kinds of things. Uh, so not just music, it could also be used for all different types of content creation. And it basically allows you to have almost like an inverted Facebook, this sort of way where you're peer-to-peer -peer connecting not only with your fans, but your fans are connecting with other fans. And then if they wanna, let's say there's a Tatiana coin, there's a John coin, and there's a Liliana coin, you know, they can kind of connect with those rooms. So one of the cool things that we've done now that we're kind of getting ready to launch is we've partnered with Rocket Chat. And Rocket Chat d has a token controlled access thing. So now if you have a Tatiana coin, or let's say you make a super fan coin. So somebody wants to have access to all my music and I'll say, okay, cool, give me $100, you get this super fan coin and you're gonna get all my music until then. So that person would have, let's say, access to certain exclusive chats. You can also do ticketing through uh, a tokenized system. We've done uh, albums where an album would be represented with a digital token. So this way you bring ownership back into music and you actually have a token that you can sell to somebody else and it no longer is in your possession because with digital um, content, it's like, it's weird because it's sort of devalued all, all of this digital content to a point where the artist can't really survive anymore. So our method is to make it almost like a pay to play thing, but basically um, fans and you know people in the community are paying two and a half cents a stream if they like a song enough to or in order to do that. And then the artist is getting a huge portion of that, like 10 to 20 times more than what the average industry streaming fee is. But at the end of the day, the fans, number one, they know that they're really supporting their artists, you know, so they get the good, good vibes and stuff and they get to be a part of the community. But they're also not really gonna end up spending more than they would on a monthly unlimited streaming option either. I mean, it's hard to compete with unlimited, but what we think that we're really building here is, is a community. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, as a uh, member of the cryptocurrency community, I remember listening to uh, stories about the Silk Road. And I was like, what the hell is the Silk Road stuff? I mean, this is like, what was this guy? Why is he selling drugs in the internet? Sounds like a bad idea. Very unsympathetic as a new person. But then I, I started talking to Lynn, and Lynn Ulbricht is Ross's mother. Ross Ulbricht is now serving double life plus 40 years in prison for all nonviolent crimes. And Basically, Lynn told me the story. So for those of you that aren't familiar, um, the Silk Road was, uh, you know, sort of like a, the first free market experiment um, using cryptocurrency, and it allowed people to buy anything that they wanted as long as it didn't really harm anybody else. So, you know, they sold Bibles, they sold medicine, and of course they sold a bunch of drugs, because uh, people like those. And apparently the drug war has not uh, stopped that whole uh, party atmosphere. And in fact, it's made it a lot worse. And so, some studies have shown that the Silk Road actually reduced violence in the drug industry significantly. Like your chances of dying are five times less if you're buying drugs on the Silk Road. Now everybody knows drugs are a big problem, shouldn't do drugs, blah, 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 but people are doing them. And so the method that we've, you know, we have these no-knock raids and all these crazy violent wars everywhere based a lot of times around the drug war. And I think that once I understood the impetus for the site and also the corruption behind the site, I was much more intrigued and much more sympathetic. And I thought, well, everybody's gonna think the way that I thought, right? And like, ah, it's some drug guy, whatever, no one cares. But it's actually a really big issue that impacts a lot of us because there were all, all of these different precedents being set with that case and there was so much corruption and it was completely unchecked. And Ross became sort of the, the sacrificial lamb um, for, creating a website. He wasn't even the main drug dealer. And it was really disturbing. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to add a little bit of, a huma of humanity to a potentially kind of eek story. And so I, I wrote The Silk Road. So I'm gonna play that for you guys now. There was a man who did the unspoken. He looked for freedom from the violence. No one is perfect when there's new ground broken. A mess is made and someone gets blamed. He had a dream of harmony as you wish to live out our own. 
not stand for this skin that have you fall along the silk road. This ain't the movies, there's a war in the streets. The innocent are in jail. We pray for justice and we want to be free. And hope the truth will prevail. He had a dream of harmony as we wish to live out. And first cannot have you fall along the silk road. We can't give up, we cannot quit. Don't be afraid. We have a voice, and this is it. to live out our own. We cannot stand for this, cannot have you fall along the silk road. We cannot stand for this, cannot have you fall along the silk road. Thank you. So the crazy thing about that song is that I wrote it before I even met Ross. So a lot of people haven't even gotten to meet Ross, right? Because he's in jail and all, and they don't really allow many visitors. Um, but I was, uh, you know, friends with uh, Ross's mom for such a long time, and I'm really good friends with his sister. She now works with me at my company. And, uh, and I got a chance to go and visit Ross. We had been corresponding. And... Going into that prison was one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life. I mean, and I've had some really, really bad things happen. There is nothing out there like prison. And it is sick. And it is disgusting that our country is supposed to be the land of the free. And we have so many more people that in jail than anywhere else in the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's obscene. And going there and seeing these women and with their with their children crawling all over them being like i want to see daddy i want to see daddy don't take me away like crying it's a nightmare in there and and you know a lot of us for me especially like i like to be all fight the man and whatever but i don't know about anything until i walked into the prison because it's nothing like you would ever imagine and ross himself is one of the most remarkable people i've ever met if there's ever a person that doesn't belong in jail it's ross ulbricht he's kind He's thoughtful. He listens to, I mean, so many people write him. And, you know, I've really talked to him about a lot of things that have happened to me. And he's been an incredible friend. And it's like, how do you even complain to somebody who's in jail for double life plus 40 years for all nonviolent crimes? And for that person to have the capacity to give a shit about somebody else and to actually think things through with you. And I remember one of the first things that he wrote me was, yeah, you know, prison is really terrible. But. Uh, you know, at least I'm, like, at least it's only two guys to a cell, and at least I have, you know, food three times a day. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's looking at it in this way, and I can't put a cheery face on when I'm, you know, stuck in traffic or something. I mean, it was a really pivotal moment for me um, in a lot of different ways, and it also kind of clued me into a, a darker thing that we're, we're sort of fighting. And Ross, you know, I, I put his song on my new album. It's called Keep the Faith. And... Uh, Ross, for my birthday, decided, since, you know, I had created an art for him, he drew a picture of me. And and I thought, wow, this would make an incredible album cover. And so I used this album cover by Ross, which apparently I also don't have behind me. Um, but anyway, so I used this as the album cover because I thought that it really illustrated something important. The drug war is a contentious issue. Uh, even though a lot of people don't really believe in it, it's still like against status quo to be too outlandish about it, right? And Ross's case is really, really 
it's a touchy case. It talks about a lot of different things. It's very challenging to the state. If I had a record label, do you think that they would let me do that? No. They'd be like, sorry, girl, get in your underwear and start shaking it. And that's the environment that I feel that the music industry sort of encourages uh, is that, like, look, again, I mean, I like to go out. I like to shake it or whatever, but it's too much. Let's have some kind of variety. Our souls are dying. We have all this terrible stuff going on, and we have no music that's reflecting that, at least not music on the radio. And that's why I think that creating alternative systems like a Tatiana coin and kind of giving people back control, not just the the artists, but the fans. Like, you guys aren't thrilled with what's on the radio. I mean, nobody listens to the radio anymore anyway, unless you're stuck without, uh, without another option. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I think I think that there are a lot of things that are that are available for a lot of different people. And even though it's been a very long journey, I'm very happy that we've come to this point where we're actually starting to onboard people. One of the things that uh, has been a passion project for me is Art for Ross. So it started out in Porkfest a couple of years ago, and we're you know Ross is an artist. He draws really beautiful uh, pictures in prison, and um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we started you know drawing for him? And I had already made him these like. Literally, I look like I'm in sixth grade. <laughs> uh, these little drawings, because it was really neat, but it was a really cool way to connect with him. And I thought, wow, that's neat. So we were at Porkfest, and we all sat around with art supplies, and we sent him a whole bunch of art. We all made him all different pictures. We had glitter and all this fun stuff. And, and it made me think, well, this is a really great way to bond with people. It's sort of in line with my view of using art to connect with communities. And there have been a lot of um, artists that have wanted to kind of donate their work to the Free Ross Fund, because it's quite expensive. Uh, to fight the power, and um, and that's really great. So one of the things that we have is you can do a living album, and what the living album is is it's a token, right? It's tradable, just like any other kind of token. But on there, you would have let's say 10, 20, 30 different artists submitting either music and not in the not too far distant future even visual art, and they would all basically put it onto like this one mixtape, like that's that album token is like a mixtape and it's sort of ever evolving and then people who want to support free ross they can buy that they get all of this music but that's another way to sort of spread the word spread the message and kind of unify people and the technology allows us that whenever those are sold not only are the artists paid out by whatever percentage that we want to set but the you can also automatically set it to donate to your charity of choice so obviously with mine the theme being art for ross obviously i'd be donating it to uh, the American Black Cross, which raises funds for political prisoners around the country, and they're a big supporter of Ross. So maybe that's how I would do it. And then I could get people around a cause. I think that's really, really cool. So yeah, you could do it for a brand. You know, let's say Walmart wants to get some ladies to go shopping, maybe a female singer, songwriter, one. It's like, okay. And that's cool, and that's really valuable for them. Uh, and it's neat because the artists, they get the cross promotion. But for me, obviously, my passion is, is using it for um, cause-based kind of activism. And I look forward to exploring that a little bit more. Um, there's another guy here, Johnny Dabowski. I don't know if you guys have seen him. He played last night with me. He's going to do something with Rock and Renew, and they're going to do a token with artists around uh, urban renewal projects and different kinds of things like that. So um, I think injecting that into the conversation with artists is really important. And also, you know, artists are the messengers. So even though I, I've thought of my Tatiana coin as a little bit of a sneak attack, right? Um, because if somebody has a Tatiana coin, you can kind of not let them know that they're signing up for a wallet. And they're just like, the way that we've kind of done it is that we, we've made it so you can buy Tatiana coins with USD, you can buy it with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. But you also don't necessarily need to have a wallet. Um, we did sort of a combination where certain things are on-chain, certain things are off-chain. For example, if you're selling a song and it's a dollar, then it might not be the best thing to do it as a, as a counterparty transaction because it might be too expensive. Um, and now, like, we've sort of kind of blended these solutions, and the guys are doing a tech crowd sale. So if you guys are interested in the tech stuff, um, I would go to tokenly.com, and you can kind of read up about that. I'm not going to try and torture you with my little attempts at explaining it. Um, but one thing that I didn't mention that I thought was really neat was um, artist autonomy, not only over creating their own token, which is essentially like a little bit like an ICO that's not bad because you have other, you know, ICOs, right? You, a little bit sketchy. But with this, because it has these additional features, you don't really have to worry about that anymore. We're really grateful for that ruling because at least that like makes our path a little bit more clear. But as an artist, you can also um, set your own pricing. 
So if I want to do a special and say, like, everybody going to the Nectus conference gets all my music for 10 cents a song today only, I could do that. If I had iTunes, I certainly couldn't do that. If tomorrow I want to sell the same album for $20 that I sold the next day for, like, 50 or whatever it is, like, I can control all of that. And I can have my licensing all built into it as well. So um, right now we're working only with Counterparty, but we're making it compatible with ERC-20 tokens in the next, I think it's ERC-20, in the next uh, couple weeks. So that's really cool. And we've already started doing these different kinds of pilot projects. One of them, there's a lady, um, Consuelo Vanderbilt Coaston, and she created a almost like a LinkedIn for creatives. And so they did a token that's sort of a fan collectible for a fashion designer at New York Fashion Week, Milan Breton. And so he had his own Milan Breton token. And I think it's a really cool way to just get people into crypto without torturing them and explaining to them the Federal Reserve. Um, so I don't know. I think I think that uh, all this stuff is is really invigorating for me to work on. It's very challenging, much more so than I ever thought. But I also think that artists have that resilient spirit. Uh, people make fun of artists. They get a real job. Real artists work harder than most regular people because we do our day job, and then we have to look good, right? So we got to do all our, you know, healthcare is important to us, right? We need to like keep our instruments healthy, and then we have to do our music. And recording is really expensive, even if you do it at home. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges for being an artist. Um, so I hope that this provides some solutions, and I'm really excited to see how things evolve. Um, beyond just thinking about registering work on the blockchain. I mean, yeah, registering your work on the blockchain is fine. But I think creating new connections and new uh, revenue streams is really what we're, what we're sort of seeing as just the beginning of the possibilities. Uh, so, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Do you guys have any questions? I don't know what time it is. I, I've just been sort of talking. Does anybody know what my timing is? How are we doing? Oh, good. Oh, wow. Look, I filled the time. I'm so proud. Oh, Miss, you have a question. Hi. Yes, I like control. <laughs> Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm I think that's going to be hard, though, because nobody's going to, I mean, I could do it if I'm playing alone. I've actually looked into that. Oh, I'm sorry. To repeat the question, um, I, uh, she was asking about the tuning of the harmonics differently instead of being 441 to, what, 435 or, oh, 440 versus 432. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's something to be said for the weaponization of music, not just in that regard. I mean, yeah, that that is something like on a deeper level, but I the messages are really clearly ridiculous. Right. Well, you know, it's funny in, in the in the Bitcoin jingle, I've always taken music as the most sacred of all things. I'm not a religious person, but I believe in the in the sanctity of music. And uh and I wrote a line in the Bitcoin jingle. I said, you know, I used to cry to myself that we didn't have a chance. But Nakamoto came along with more than a song and gave the labor back to man. I mean that. I think that this has the power to do even more 
than a song. Because, you know, we've seen how certain songs, look, people still love Bob Dylan, but you don't hear him talking about the war. You know what I mean? Uh, it's. We don't, th it, it didn't change enough. It changes the culture in a way, but we need more than that. We need stronger weapons against an infrastructure that is set up to treat us like cattle. And that's kind of putting it kindly. <laughs> um, any, any more questions for, from anyone? Thank you for that. We should try that later, like a little jam. We'll tune it. Correct. Yes, I actually can get you something that explains it a little bit more. But basically, with the Howey test, oh, I hate the weighing in on this. But basically, if you have your token and it does more than just it's like a speculative instrument, that's when you're sort of okay. So the the coin doesn't just really like I would think that the the value of the coin and using it as a digital gift certificate is maybe like one fifth of the experience of what you're trying to build with the person. So I think that's why we're okay. But before that, we just didn't know how they would rule in the first place. So that's what made it really challenging. Sure, follow up. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Do you want to ask your follow up? <laughs> I think we got a couple more minutes. So I think this is really interesting. What I found was, um, I'll, I'll wrap it up, sorry. Um, I found, <laughs> oh, three minutes. Okay, cool. So I, uh, we did a second crowdfund, right, in February of this year because I wanted to promote the record, right? And we raised $10,000 again. But what I realized is that you can't depend on your fans to fund you completely exclusively uh, because when you're first starting out, sorry, you're, you know, you, you need at least like $1,500 to do a demo and, you know, you, you need like a little, an egg. And I think that that's unfair because if you don't have rich friends that are going to support you, it doesn't mean that your music is bad. So I would love to bring in a way for people to invest and maybe diversify that investment so it's not as volatile since, you know, one artist is sort of, you know, a black hole. You never know what's going to happen there. Um, and that's something that is definitely on our trajectory. Now that we have that clarity, it's a little bit easier to progress in that point. So if people want to find out more about what we're building, you'll be hearing about it in the, in the press over the next couple of weeks and months, uh, but tokenly.com, and the product is token.fm. Um, so anyway, on that happy note, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I had a really great time, and I'll be seeing you here. Thank you for having me.